going here. Um, this is Mike uh, Dutter from uh, Marquette, and and uh, just wanted to uh, sorry for the short notice for this, but um, uh, Clara Peterson, she's a researcher at the at University of Wisconsin. And, um, Claire and, and Mark Cooley and some of her colleagues from uh, University of Wisconsin as well as um, also um, NASA have um, deployed some equipment up here uh, to basically research lake vex snow microphysics and uh, do. And there's a whole bunch of different little research projects that are coming out of this data. They've deployed a, both a micro rain radar and uh, which is a vertically pointed radar as well as a, um, um, it's called a precipitation imaging package, I think, or, or the PIP, uh, which is essentially a camera that, um, and that's uh, from NASA. Um, um, Larry Blyven from uh, NASA Wallops has uh, developed this piece of equipment that basically takes uh, pictures, three, 380 frames per second of, of, uh, of precipitation, or in, in our case, snow, snowfall. And so there, uh, so what's, so what basically what's going on is that we're taking this, uh, uh, they're taking this data from the MRR as well as the PIP and doing um, all kinds of uh, research and, and ongoing research as well. So without further ado, um, I will let Claire take over and, and um, she has some slides to show you. I think everyone can see it. And um, um, from there, um, you know, at the end, she'll be happy to take some questions as well. So Claire, thanks for coming and uh, go ahead. Um, so I'm Claire Patterson. I'm a researcher with the University of Wisconsin. Um, I work uh, both on this ground suite as well as a, another ground suite in Greenland and do work with satellite and aircraft campaigns. So um, and this project's been a lot of fun. Um, we have two winters worth of data. We're going to have a third winter here coming up. And we have two very contrasting winters, so that's been really nice for our data set. So um, I'm briefly going to go through, this is kind of a sutured together multiple talks and research, so some of the stuff I'll go through rather quickly to get to the um, interesting ground-based data. But um, I just wanted to acknowledge our whole group of people we work with. Um, like Mike said, we work with people at NASA, uh, Larry Blivin and Walt Peterson, um, UW, the office here has been great, of course, and then we have a bunch of students and other researchers and that have been helping us out with this project. So first slide just talks about just showing a map of global snowfall for 2012. And it's just to show, kind of give you an outline of why we're actually concerned with this. Of course, hydrological cycle impacts, radiative balance, cryosphere, and societal. And so we need to know what snowfall modes these are in, because that helps us better model and better detect. Um, the snowfall from satellite. So we want to know where it snows. We want to have accurate accumulation estimates. And we want to know the different types of snowfall. So most of these satellites that we work with are um, spaceborne radar and microwave radiometer, so passive microwave as well. And uh, Mark Cooley works heavily with both these satellites, um, CloudSat, which is uh, part of the A-Train, um, which is a group of several instruments, maybe you all are familiar with it, but there's LIDAR, there's passive microwave, there's active microwave, there's infrared, there's everything all in a line together so that they can, you can co-locate that data. Um, I don't work with CloudSet, so we're going to skip that. <laughs> I work a bit with GPM, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, so that launched last year. Um, and it's been doing great. It has a dual frequency precipitation radar. Um, jointly developed by the U.S. and Japan, and then a GPM microwave imager, um, which so passive microwave as well. And um, the people we work with at NASA Wallace, Larry and Walt, are heavily involved with GPM, specifically the GPM ground validation campaigns, of which there's been several, and we are now a friend of <laughs> the GPM ground validation. In fact, we are now officially on the NASA repository, the data that's been taken here. Um, is officially being uploaded to the NASA re repository as part of their ground validation, which is great. This is just a nice image of kind of all the different instruments working together to try to image snowfall and precipitation. So um, this is an image from Mark Cooley's paper, which is coming out or came out this year, just looking at 
mean snowfall accumulation from 2006 to 2010, and just kind of highlighting um, that there's lots of different types of snowfall. For example, this is how CloudSat partitions different types of snow, so snowfall. You see synoptic or system snow in the top left. You see shallow convective snow in the top right. Um, and then they have these different cloud classifications, depending on like this one in Greenland, you see a nimbostratus cloud case, and then a different one where you have a, a shallow stratocumulus. And so CloudSet wants to do these kind of second, third level retrievals where they're actually partitioning what types of clouds and snow. This is important for just getting better measurements and, and informing the models is kind of always the end goal to better forecast as well as but accurately um, predict changes in snowfall. Um, I'm going to allow yeah, go to yeah, join. Thanks. So um, this is another image from Mark's CloudSet paper where you see shallow snowfall fraction and deeper snowfall fraction. Now granted, this is on a very rough resolution grid, but it gives you an idea roughly of where we see shallow versus deeper snow. And if we go to the next slide. So here is a um, more regionally focused where I believe, are you looking at the top? I can't quite tell. Canada? No, Arctic? 70, 75. So. That's actually the, yeah, that's actually the that's north of Norway here. Oh, yeah, so it is the Arctic. So, yeah, so you see a lot of shallow snowfall over the ocean is common. So one thing is I always tell people about lake effect snow. It's like, oh, why should I care about lake effect snow? Well, we don't have to tell people in the Great Lakes why. But um, one thing is, is um, I like to call it, say, well, lake effect snow and ocean effect snow are the same system you get. Just, it's the same mechanism. It's the same processes going on. And, Ocean effect snow has huge, you know, huge impacts, as you can see in the Arctic, as well as Japan. Most of their snow comes from essentially lake effect, except it's ocean. <laughs> so, so water effect snow, basically, is an important thing to be studying. And then uh, the, the grid's not so great for the Great Lakes. That's one reason we want to have intensive ground focus in the Great Lakes, because we get better accuracy here from um, satellite. It's not doing um, quite as well. And so here you have some shallow versus deep snowfall partitioning um, over Great Lakes and Greenland, just to give you an idea of what we get from CloudSat. So now if we actually go to what I find more interesting, the ground-based validation is we're trying to um, get snowfall rates and accumulation, frequency of occurrence, and partitioning statistics to help kind of dial in these retrievals that satellites use. Obviously, the satellites give us some kind of engineering data, which then has become you know, level one data and then becomes retrievals. But um, that's all depending on a lot of assumptions, right? So the ground, the ground validation work is all to help better inform the assumptions we're making to create better retrievals. Um, so here's just some examples. This is the one at Marquette, our microarray radar. Uh, this is an example of shallow snowfall at Summit, Greenland, the MMCR, different frequency, but same idea, nice shallow snowfall. This is actually at Summit, what's interesting is when we see the shallow snowfall, it's really, really moist. And when we see the deeper systems, they're very, very dry. So to give you an example of why this is important, so here is a shallow snowfall case. This is kind of an extreme shallow snowfall case. But most CloudSat and the radar in CloudSat and the radar in GTM both only see down to a kilometer. So essentially, they're going to see this system and say nothing's there, but there's no snowfall. And this case is really great because not only is it for most of the day going to say there's no snow, then you get Virga, and then it's like, oh, it's snowing, but it's actually not snowing. So there may be kind of a balancing effect in there, but it's still, it's, it, would be, it would be categorizing it incorrectly. So we want to try to compensate for some of these, like, sub one kilometer observations and, and see if there's, if there's patterns that can be recognized that can then help inform what's happening in that lowest kilometer, where we do see lots of changes. In addition to the radar, I'm not really sure why that didn't come out, but in addition to the radar, we're also, it's important to create what we call a Z to S relationships. This is more Mark's thing and not quite as much my thing, but we want to take the reflectivity and actually get some kind of snowfall rate out of that. And certainly as forecasters, you guys are going to be very interested in that. And that, of course, depends on the frequency of the radar you're using and the ice habits, because often once most frequencies with radars you use, you're getting into 
me scattering and then particle habit and um, distribution becomes, um, as you can see here in kind of the, the purple and green lines, you start to see the me scattering. And so then, then it becomes as the particles get larger when you have snow, then you have different types of scattering and you have a different Z to S relationship. So understanding, in addition to radar data, having an idea of uh, particle size distribution helps inform these retrievals as well. So we're going to look at, I'm not, unfortunately it's not telling me what slide number when I converted it, but now we're looking at the MRRZ um, reflectivity data for uh, 2014, February 5th. And so this is an example of, uh, we have a quick look site, which I'll advertise in a second, but this is an example of you looking at radar data at the top and its complementary uh, PIP data on the bottom. So the radar data shows time height reflectivity, and the PIP data shows time height um, basically uh, counts of the drop size distribution. And uh, we see a lot of interesting features. This is a nice one because you see, when you see this spike in reflectivity, you see this associated spike in um, diameter size in the PIP. This is not too surprising, but this is nice to see because the PIP at ground level, our first, um, our first reliable um, bin for reflectivity is at about 90 meters. That's right, 90 meters. So it's nice to um, see that there is some correlation going on between the PIP and MRR, which we would expect, but there are changes that can happen at the ground. Um, so we use these ground, we use these snowfall rates and accumulation and all this data from the ground-based validation and the in-situ microphysics from the radar as well as the PIP to try to piece together better assumptions for our retrievals. And so one thing we need for that is long-term data sets. Right now we have two winters, three winters is better, um, hopefully indefinite winters is best. And so and then as we get more and more statistics, we will, we've already started to see some patterns, but that's kind of the end goal. So this is, you guys don't need to know why we picked Marquette, because you live here. <laughs> but for those who don't, we wanted somewhere that had a good amount of snowfall for our, our project. And also, Mark Cooley grew up in Ishpeming, so it had some, he wanted to do a, an experiment if possible in his hometown. So that's the lower right pitch, I believe, this is dog when he was growing up in, you know, as usual winter in <laughs> Ishpeming, it looks like. <laughs> But yeah, he likes showing that dog is always in his talk. So to give you an idea of the observatory here, we have the precipitation imaging package. The PIP is simply a bright halogen lamp that is pointed um, very accurately at a camera, and you get 2D images of particles falling, basically shadows. But it does give a really nice size distribution. We can't determine necessarily habit, but we get a lot of information from it. Um, Here's an example of, you get some shadowed images you can see on the left and you can kind of partition some. We, we in all honesty, we never get any that look quite that, <laughs> like those plates and stellar crystals don't always come out that well. But we certainly can tell small grapple, we can tell um, dendrites, we can tell big fluffy snow when we have these big aggregates from lake effect. We do see statistical differences in those um, particle size distribution. Additionally, we have the micro rain radar. So that's Mark and myself. I'm being hidden by the various uh, wrapping of the radar. <laughs> Putting up the MRR. You can see we have tied down with cinder blocks, so it won't go anywhere. Um, so the micro rain radar, um, so in this name it says rain. It's actually not optimized for snow. However, we use um, the Max Mon algorithm. Um, Mon's group, um, along with Stefan Kneifel up in um, Montreal. Montreal, or they're in Quebec. They might be in Montreal. But they have developed a lot of nice algorithms for using radars with snow. And um, if anyone wants to talk the details of the technical part of that, we can um, at the end of the call, or I can send the paper as a reference for it. But essentially, it, it, it changes the sensitivity of the radar. It kind of shifts things down so that we're able to see um, the lighter falling snow. We do then what happens if we have a really heavy thunder rainstorm here, we do saturate the radars reflectivity, but for us, wanting to look at snow, we don't care. We're fine with the radar being saturated. We're more interested in having the snow sensitivity. 
So this was the first day we deployed, and we drove up and all this, and we had this, like, constant <laughs> snow falling the entire time, a nice shallow system, so this was really great. Um, and we've basically, since this time, been running, and I think I calculated statistics, we're up, we have 98.7% uptime um, for that's both instruments. So they have worked really well. We have a system that works out really well where we can um, get, transfer the data every day and um, through a secure transfer, and then I process it through an automatic um, job that runs on our servers at UW, and then it gets sent to our website, which I will show in a little bit. But essentially, this is what you're looking at is what the website gives you every day, so you can look through conditions. So at the end of um, at zero, like a little after zero UTC, we run this job, and then so you have data. And so right now we're almost at two years of data, which is great. So the funny thing about this is that <laughs> we deployed the the instrument on January 4th. Uh, it got a little delayed. We deployed January 17th. We would have liked to deploy it like in November, but you know we take what we can get. And very soon thereafter, the lake closed up and never open back up that year, <laughs> which was like, this is the famous year where everybody was going to ice caves and driving everybody crazy up there. And um, by February, I think by February 9th, it was officially 100% covered and, or all, virtually, and it was very thick ice. This was not ice that was going to move around. This wasn't ice that was like kind of, because this year it's been a lot of like, I've watched the, the NOAA forecast and it's been sometimes covered, but a lot of it's thin. So we get a really windy day and it opens right back up. And so at first we were like, oh, this is so disappointing. And this is unfortunate where a lake effect site, but because this last winter that we just had had so much open water, it's been a great contrast, as you'll see when we get to the statistics. So um, I wanted to talk about this awesome, so after we had this frozen winter where we got a lot of good data, a lovely summer, and then back to winter in November, and right early season, there was a, I'd say a historic, storm, and certainly you guys think so, um, but it got a little overshadowed maybe by the Buffalo storm. <laughs> I think the Buffalo one happened a day later or a day Probably before. Later. It was something where you guys, we were all excited about this one and people were talking about Buffalo. And, but this one was really impressive, and it, from our standpoint, it was really interesting. Um, and I know there was a lot going on here, but I wanted to go through what our instruments saw for this time period. So here we have November 10th. And our radar goes up to three kilometers. That's on purpose because we, we didn't go down to just one because we want to see synoptic versus lake effect. We want to see that shift. We want to be able to easily um, identify the two. And so here you see this big classic kind of synoptic feature coming in, lots of turbulence. You can see a ton going on around almost like 2300 UTC. And you see a lot of small particles. You're having a really high. This is log distribution, so it's a little deceiving, but you have a lot of particles, and they're not huge. Um, they're big, but, but then what happens, so here's um, this next slide is um, just some of the other radars, what they were showing. And, and some of them really do miss part of this because of the shadow. So the radar here has a bit of a shadow, but also uh, the satellites. The, this is the KA, KU band from the GPM overpass. doesn't quite catch everything, so this is why it's important to have these ground-based measurements, too. So here's November 11th. This was, like, a really unique day. Um, so now you see a big change of particle size distribution. For one thing, you can still see the fall streaks from the synoptic case. You see enhancement of the fall streaks. I think it's a, especially, like, you can see it around 1,100 UTC. You see this bright fall streak in, at, in the lowest layer after it crosses through the boundary layer, and it's fully in the embedded lake effects now you see it really brighten up, and you see just huge particle sizes throughout this entire event. You also see the classic pulsing that we see in lake effect where you have these turbulent rolls, so you get these pulses of, of high reflectivity, um, large particles, and you see that in both the PIP data where you see the pulsing, especially when it's like around 0400 where you have more just lake effect on its own. Um, and then in the embedded lake effect, the, the synoptic and lake effect Draw, uh, particle size distribution is a little harder to pull apart. But if we go to, and here is a nice embedded lake effect example. This is from a different day because we got, we're able to get better data, but essentially the same thing is happening as here. Now if we go to November 11th, we, oh, sorry, um, we're not at 12 yet. Okay, so one thing I was going to 
mentioned the cable got damaged and we could actually see um, the dish heater being off for a little bit. But then right here is when um, was rapidly um, swept off, which was great, the, the MRR. And the snow was very dry, so from that point on, it wasn't an issue for attenuation. And you can really see the reflectivity picked up quite a bit. So it was awesome that people here, even though they were neck deep in snow, were able to go out and brush that off, and we got really nice data. Um, so then, after we've gone from synoptic to embedded lake effect, now on November 12th, we have what I would call pure lake effect, where you see the bright banding and the reflectivity, you see the pulsing and the uh, particle size distribution. This was just like a fantastic event. We were really excited about it. Maybe you guys up here were less excited. It was probably <laughs> an exciting forecasting yeah, we event. Excited. It was the first big It was the year. first big, yeah. <laughs> so everyone, if this happened in like February uh, these dates, it might have been less exciting. Because you would have well, had so much April. It happened in April. Yeah, you guys had enough of it. Yeah. We were done with it in April. And you guys had some big lake effect ones in January, which I might show later. But this is kind of neat. We looked at, um, so on the left in the background, you have um, the different days. So the red is the synoptic day, the green is the embedded lake effect, and the blue is the pure lake effect for basically number versus diameter. And you definitely see different behavior. And I've labeled the red particle size distribution corresponds to the red, and the blue corresponds to the blue. So you, I mean, you, it's just different ways of looking at things. But it does give you an idea of the uh, particle size distribution, how much that differs, the blue versus the red, on um, that day, or that, that storm system. So that was fantastic. So I was going to go through a couple um, really nice different types of events that we've seen here. Um, for snow, we have all kinds of events, but I was going to focus on snow. Uh, this is lake effect, really nice lake effect case that was January 25th. And I know, I think it was chatting with you, Mike, about this when this was going on or right yeah. after. Because I think you guys estimated there was a 45 to 1 or 60 to 1, somewhere between there for what you guys yeah, measured for well. depth, which is like incredible. Because these reflectivities, as well, they're not very big. <laughs> I mean, these are still very light reflectivities, but you're just getting huge particle sizes. And um, you get the classic banded structure. You can see that in the. Um, in the reflectivity, the MRR, as well as the particle size. One thing I want to note is when we see these lake effect cases, the boundary layer height, this height of the precipitation is really stable. When we see orographic cases, which I'll talk about in a second, the boundary layer height is much more variable, which makes sense. I mean, the lake effect machine is either on or off. You either have enough energy and enough wind that's picking up a certain amount of moisture to create the lake effect machine, or it's done. There. So I think um, that's a really interesting, I'm interested in the boundary layer effects. Um, so I'll talk about some of my work a little later on for that. And this is the next red from that day. You can see the banding. A classic lake effect. So here's an orographic. So what's been interesting as we've looked at these cases, we weren't expecting as much orographic snow. Maybe this is not a surprise to you guys. You live here, and anecdotally, of course, you're like, oh, we're having an upslope snow day. You know, but we think of orographic snow, you think of Colorado, you think of you know, the mountains. But here, you ha definitely have enough orography to have um, a good amount of orographic snow. Now, this was the, we know this is orographic. This is, la uh, this is after the lake is frozen. Um, this is March 8th of 2014. The lake was totally frozen. You see what I was saying with the boundary layer depth is not quite as stable. You don't have the pulsing like you do with lake effect. And you get really huge particles, much like lake effect snow, but really different drop size distribution. I mean, so if you look, go back to the very different. So this is neat. And the orographic snows don't see the banding in the next rad. And uh, the lake was the March 7th. This is an example of the lake ice percentage. So that was a really interesting case. We weren't expecting orographic snow happened quite a bit. And because we had the winter where it was mostly frozen, we see a ton of orographic snow. So that was an interesting event. So here's synoptic snow with a frozen lake on the left. You see the classic fall streaks. You see a lot of turbulence. And then synoptic snow with open lake. This is that embedded case where you do see uh, similar synoptic behavior. But then, then the lake effect, you see that enhancement of the snowfall below the boundary layer because you have the lake effect snow embedded. Um, and that much more snowfall. So enhanced by the LES with open water, and this is after.
semester. This was in February 14, 2014. So I like this. Um, I love this because this is a great example. I really want to get this is like a trifecta of snow. I really want to get the quadfecta where we have <laughs> all four types. But here what you see on this December 2nd, we have orographic from about 0800 to like noon. We have Virga and we have synoptic. And you can see the different, especially the very different drop size distributions between orographic and um, synoptic is really interesting. So what I need is like a little link effect from zero to 400. It would have been <laughs> perfect. So one of these days we'll get all four. So I, I love that day. So we've gotten lots of ideas and lots of um, work just by having this Quick Looks. Um, I know you guys use this here, the Quick Looks browser. So all these images um, are data that's taken daily, um, processed by some programs that I wrote, but now they're automatically done. And then we're up on our server. So. Um, this is, uh, I'll pause for a second here, so those on the phone, if you're interested, in the top left is the um, website address. And it's updated every day, and there's two years' worth of data, and you can just browse through any days you are interested in. And then if you are interested in the data, you can contact myself or Mark. Both of our um, contact info is on this page. And uh, we'd be happy to get the net CDFs or raw data for people to look at. Um, so that's kind of the case study part. I'm briefly going to talk about something I'm doing. So I work on statistics, and I'm trying to do, when I talked early, earlier in the talk, I talked about it's important to partition snow and cloud types. That's a lot of what satellites want to do. Um, and so I'm using the motivation um, from GPM, basically, that the radar has a 12 dBZ limit, and they have a one kilometer height limit. And um, this is a different way to look at the radar data. I'll explain that in a second. But basically, um, all of this is being missed. And that's all that lower right is not being detected by the GBM DPR. And um, so we're trying to make an argument to be like, we need to be supplementing with these ground sites, especially where there's a lot of shallow snow. Now, GBM has an extensive ground network in um, Canada. They work with Environment Canada, and they have a ground network of MRs and POS, which is a precipitation, it's a, it's a, it's a X-band radar that's looking just at the volume of air right above it. So it doesn't have height resolution, but it gives you um, a lot of information about the actual snowfall at, at ground level. I kind of want one of those up here. <laughs> we'll see. We're going to work yeah, on stuff. Really Try to get a sciliometer and a couple things. But anyway, so um, I'm going to... We just went through. We just went through a lot of these time, height, reflectivity figures. So you guys are familiar with this. So now what I've taken is that same day. I've taken this day, and I instead now time is of no consequence. I don't care about time anymore. I've binned everything by height, and now reflectivity is on the bottom, and this is just count. Essentially, these are called contoured frequency by altitude diagram C pads. They're just PDFs. They're just it's just statistics. But now we're not, we don't want to care, we're not caring about time evolution. We're caring purely about statistics. So you can kind of see, you can now talk about characteristics of this day. We knew it was a shallow day, we knew it was lake effect. But what you see here is like, oh, we kind of can see those things grow as they're falling. We get a nice, a bit of a structure if you're squinting. And some of my more, uh, one person I work with, he's really good at statistics, but he's also very, careful about, um, it take, he's very skeptical, which is good. <laughs> but it takes him a while to get convinced that that looks like necessarily gross. But to me, it does. And here's an, or, so I'm going to do the same thing for an orographic day. So now, and this is a very light orographic day. So lighter reflectivity, I would argue that there's not necessarily evidence of growth. It looks like there's a bimodality, actually, that there's two peaks. I mean, and this is just data from one day, but this is just examples of different how we would partition different cases. Here's a big synoptic snow day. You can see bright band from about like 13 to 16. And so synoptic snow case. Very narrow, higher reflectivity, lots of data up high, um, basically because um, we, have a, we have quite a bit of count up in this high region. But you see that peak, the reflectivity peaks somewhere around kind of like 1.3 kilometers or so 
and you get that classic kind of false streak turbulent shape. So the goal of this is to take the MRR data and do the same kind of partitioning for a long, so instead of just doing day by day, I'm going to take all the days and I'm going to see what characteristics come out of doing this analysis. And then you know, we're hoping that we can then see how different cases partition and help inform what the satellites are seeing. So I also merged all the data with the Davis surface weather ops, and then I was like, well, let's just see what happens when I pick winds from various directions. So wait for sanity checks, but it also does some interesting stuff. So this is a CPAD, so this is a PDF for all snow days. And I defined, or just snow times, any instant in time where the temperature was less than 2C gets put into this. And if it sees reflectivity, then we call it snow. So that's good enough, and this is all wind directions, and this is January 2013 through March 2015. And um, now that I have the rest of the Davis data, I will update this. So now we know that lake effect depends, mechanism depends on the wind direction. So, and this is a, I did a CFA, or sorry, I did a wind rows of the site here based on the Davis data. When the temperature is less than 2.0 um, C, however, I need to modify this to do that and when the MRR sees ref reflectivity. However, good enough for now. When it's cold here, or somewhat cold, this is the wind directions you tend to see. So this is probably not a surprise to you guys. But just for sanity, when it's out of the southwest, we don't, we see some shallow snow, but we don't see predominantly shallow snow. If you remember what the all seasons, all times, shallow snow is very dominant here. That's the takeaway from that. Out of the south, which is still about half the amount of time, you have winds out of the southwest. Or graphic, light, or sorry, uh, light, synoptic, lots of different kinds of, less of range, but synoptic snow. And now northeast, I did for fun. It's just this little pocket, so it's not very many cases. However, you see shallow snow, and this is that embedded lake effect. Any sense, that's why you have that around, that reflectivity around 20, that kind of peak is the embedded lake effect. You also see some definite signs of synoptic um, snow, which is probably those tail ends that wrap up around where you're getting those synoptic with the embedded lake effect. And finally, our favorite out of the northwest, you see dominant lake effect snow. You see virtually very little synoptic. And most of the PDF is focused on like less than a kilometer. And it's, it's over half the, this is over half the cases of all snow for the two years that we have. So I also did, this is just for fun. This is not as rigorous as the stuff I just showed. But I said, ah, I'm just going to turn off. I'm going to put in a flag to say when the lake ice is on versus off. So I picked February 19th, uh, 2015. Sorry, that's just, sorry, sorry, February 9th, 2014. That's a misprint. Um, but this is snow with the open lake. So this was most of this winter, for example. And this is, was covered with ice. But however, it wasn't super rigorous. I just picked one day. And, but you definitely do see more evidence of synoptic and less of the shallow snow. So the shallow snow is still there. Now, how much of this is orographic snow? I'm still working on how to partition that out. That's kind of tough. Um, part of that has to do with wind direction, but it's not all wind direction. So. I'm still working on getting the orographic snow out. So um, we're still working on this. Um, just to give people ideas, so Mark Cooley is working on a case study paper with myself and others. I'm working on um, a publication currently with this statistics work of the different um, lake effect snow versus um, synoptic cases. And then um, we also had a bit of, this is not Super exciting, but we've had a bit of a noise issue just because there's a lot of stuff here, TV towers and whatnot. And uh, one of uh, the scientists we work with was formerly an uh, optics engineer and dealt a lot with system noise. And so he's actually done some principal component analysis to pull out the noise. So we've got kind of three different technical publications we're going to try to do at the same time. Um, for those interested, uh, the MON algorithm we use for snow, um, that's the link for it. And the data set, like I said, here's an, another link for the, um, our Quick Looks browser and uh, any extra information that people are interested in. I think that's the end.
So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, does um, anyone have any questions for Claire on the phone or in the room here? Anyone? <laughs> Bueller? Bueller? No. Oh, really quick, I'll... Um, Those images, though, you said that are on your website, they um, Voodoo Economics. <laughs> What's that? Oh, oh Voodoo Economics. <laughs> oh, that's... <laughs> goes back a couple how like when is that updated until I mean like present is it so, so yeah you so can go back and look at the here, data from yesterday yeah, yeah so here's the uh, yesterday so if you click on the header so it just that's the noise I'm talking about that's stuff up there um, that we're working on Aaron's almost finished with the noise um, this we're not sure we did a day of playing around with sure <laughs> unplugging stuff but but it's very it's very regular and it's very different looking than data. Um, in, in the raw data, um, it looks like these kind of zebra stripes. And so it's very easy to remove the principal component analysis. So that's kind of a sidetrack. But this is, um, for those watching and looking, this is the browser. You can just click on the top, but then you can just use arrow and go through all the, I'm trying to get to a not, you guys have been having clear weather. Here we go. This is a bright band case. And so you see, so we have reflectivity, top left, ball speed, top right um, for the MRR. And on the lower right, we have the PIP particle size distribution and the PIP, what's called E-density. This is an algorithm, a product that Larry blivin has been working on. It works pretty well. We have some cool days where we've had snow into rain or vice versa. And the particle density uh, does a really good job of capturing that. Go to, what was April 10th? April 10th, April 10th. Yeah. All right, so if you wanted to go to a different month, you just click up here. Yeah, you can really see that wall. Oh, yeah. Right yeah, perfect. Look at that. Lower lower right, beautiful. And you see the particle size distribution fully change. And look at this, man. So I'm guessing this this is really cool because we see this in one of the cases for GCPAX, one of the ground validation campaigns where it looks like flames. Um, I think basically you had, right, might have been, um, I don't know, a big, like, uh, cold, Pool where you we just we had well, we had Did freezing have, we had freezing rain yeah up until about right five D and that starts switching over to snow okay and then so that's, right that's right shrinking. yeah and then um yeah so you can see yeah where the it looks like it's the the layer starts so to shrink down so turbulent. and then it turned over to really heavy snow where okay. about two inches per hour wow um, from I think it was would have been about seven Z to about eleven Z I think we got about, that you were we got almost eight inches and about wow. an hour right out of it. Oh yeah, all this freezing. And I think we had this is really heavy. Or <laughs> this is um so so the reflectivity. You can see how turbulent that has been. The fall speed. You can see all these different layers. It's basically what you're seeing are different turbulent rolls within those layers, and probably these are all liquid layers too. But uh, that yeah, that was a really fantastic day. I, I think a forward that to right. Larry yeah. and Walt and you were on that email and. Larry was really excited about that day. Another another interesting day for Lake Effect. Well, yeah. and I think you, you talked about it, but the, was the oh, January. Uh, there were two in January that were right. great. There's the January 25th and the 19th. Um, let me just. Uh, yeah, the 19th, the 19th there was one that was huge. They had just. I think we, we had like 55 to 1 ratio. There was. The 19th. The, yeah. And the yeah. 20th. This day, the 20th, both days were just. Off this huge amounts from what you guys. I remember emailing and asking right. you guys what your what your ratios were, and these were really interesting days, both of them. But yeah, so if people are interested, it's fun. It, you can kind of get lost. <laughs> it happens to me a lot, but uh, it's fun to click through these because you do get a feel, you start to get a feel for certain features start to come out um, that are really interesting. But uh, yeah, so every day at zero, like a little after zero UTC, I think I have it at 0200, I pull all the data, um, this is all automatic, but I pull all the data, process all the data, upload it to our web server, and then, so at 10 p.m. your time, a little after like 10.15, this will show the previous day's data. So like at 10 tonight, it will have all of today, so from zero UTC on. So yeah, um, and it sounds like you guys, you Mike, you were saying that you guys look at this. Yeah, we do, and, and we're gonna we're gonna do some, you know, we're gonna um, get you know 
using this data, hopefully we're going to get some, you know, like like we talked about, get some operationally, you know, some things out of the, you know, with regards to density. And I, you know, I think using some of your um, plots for, like, the uh, wind direction and, and, mm -hmm. and things like that, combine the Davis data and, and uh, um, even some model in, like, some RAP analysis model data and Great. try to figure out some, 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 some things with regards to the density and, and uh, you know the snow ratios and, and whatnot. That's that's where that's where all along I think this this project has been really it was was going to really be helpful to have all this data. This I mean super high resolution data that to get figure out maybe a little better how you know the snow ratio and the snow mm -hmm. density with the snow bands. So we'll yeah. see how it goes. But uh, um, yeah, this is this is just incredible. Yeah, incredible I know the now. The NASA people are really interested in, you know, what the real snowfall amounts versus the right versus what you guys see operationally and with these extra instruments. So, and I haven't, I do have snowfall data. Right. I think a year's worth. I haven't incorporated that yet, but that will be interesting too. I'm not sure yet how I'm going to fit that. I have too many things on my list <laughs> to get to. But uh, so yeah. Hey Claire, are yeah. you are your partners in Japan doing this? Um, yeah. The ocean effect. Yeah, do you know how many sites they have? I don't know. So we do have, um, so the the part of the GPM mission, they've had um, ground campaigns all over. Uh, one was this Upper Canada, or sorry, Lower Canada, Upper Great Lakes, uh, that was GCPACs. They had one in Finland. So the Finland one did study the ocean effect, shallow snow that they have there. So I'm going to start looking at that data soon. I just got that. They had a severe storm one in North Carolina, I think was, I don't remember the name of it. And then Olympics is going to happen this winter, 2015-16, and I'm hoping to be one of the lucky people to like throw an MRR on my back and climb up a <laughs> mountain. That's going to be in the Olympic mountains, oh, cool. um, and that'll be heavy. Cool. That's going to be a lot more graphic. Oh yeah, now, yeah. But it would be really interesting. What I am finding, because I've done a little bit of work in the Rockies, but what I found is that you know, ore graphics. No, it doesn't matter if it's here, like 200 meters versus. 2,000 meters, right. the, the particle size distribution, the behavior is really similar. Yeah. I mean, that would make sense logically, but you kind of never think about orographic snow being such a big deal. Like here, we found that on the, the year that the lake ice had closed early, the first season we looked at, that the orographic snow was um, a significant amount, like 20% like, like of the snow cases you guys had. So, and, and because it's so light and fluffy, much like the lake effect, right. it has a pretty... It'd be interesting to look at those cases and what their um, ob observed snowfall depths were, because they are very light, right. fluffy, yeah. hard. Those would be very hard to mm -hmm. get the ratios. Right, right. So, any other? Were there people on the phone that had questions? Um, mm. People can always. Feel Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, this is John Ives at Central Region. Excellent talk and found this very fascinating. I was in uh, the Milwaukee office for about 12 years, and Lake Effect Snow was always cool to watch. And uh, this really is neat to be able to uh, differentiate between the synoptic snow and the uh, Lake Effect Snow, and especially when they combine together. Um, really great stuff. I was I was also curious. Yeah, it was very interesting. It kind of looked like a cliff, like you were saying, where you went the freezing rain. I think to all snow and and so forth. Saw it in a couple of the slides, and uh, I think that is uh, really interesting, just to see the differences with uh, the type of precipitation. I think that's really uh, kind of a, a neat thing there. I'd, uh, it, have you have you have you used any of this much, just to kind of differentiate between precipitation types or if just haven't had many cases? No, we actually have a fair amount. There are a couple different cases separate from snow that I'm interested in. Uh, certainly Larry Bliven, um, the developer of the PIP, and this I, I put the day back up that they mentioned April 10th. Mm -hmm. um, that lower right image of the particle density, he's been working really hard on an algorithm that shows when you have um, basically rain transitioning to snow. Now, where they are in Wallops, Virginia, they're they don't get much snow, but they definitely get more like slush and, and these melt events. So they're really interested in that. So Larry Bliven has, and and uh, Walt Peterson at, at NASA Wallops have worked on this a lot, and they're very interested in it. So the particle density is kind of the best measure right now of partitioning just uh, phase type, like rain versus right. slush versus snow. Um, to get 
to the ice habit and the particle size distribution of the snow type, that's a little more nuanced. But I think for forecasting and for in general for satellite purposes, having that E density, that lower right, is really useful. And we do have a lot of great cases going both directions where we have snow melting into rain and rain turning into snow. And I have kind of an ongoing list of interesting cases. Another thing I'm interested in is bright band. And the first part of this day, you can see the bright band. Mm -hmm. and we get really excellent bright band data from this MRR. And you see really interesting changes in fall speed. And I don't have it in the quick looks, but I also look at spectral width. The spectral width in the radar is uh, uh, one degree closer to the raw data, the power spectra. And it gives you an idea of both turbulence and particle size distribution. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really fascinating product. So I've been looking at these bright band cases as well. I am going to be speaking on some of this if anybody who's going at the AMS radars conference. So anybody who's a radar enthusiast may be going to that conference in Norman in September. I'll be talking about it a little more. Um, John, this is Mike. Yeah, I mean, in real time, we're actually we're we're lucky because we have we have the um, the displays mm -hmm. right out in our in our ops area, so we can we get like this day. And I, I know we were we were actually able to see the the freezing level, you know, that bright band and the freezing level, um, you know, real time and in other cases as well. So we're we're lucky in that sense that uh, we can we can actually use the we can use this data in real time and to get an idea of, of what's you know what's going on. You know, a lot. So you know, in like this case here, you can clearly see the, you know, the the, the bright band. You know, the, the freezing layer was falling, and then it just finally gave up and, and changed the snow. You know, went from yeah. rain to air under cut. Yeah, cold air under yeah, cut. Yeah, you can see that in that first. Yeah. <laughs> for, for about, yeah. yeah. For about two hours prior to we when we switched over here, just uh, up the hill, just a little farther, about mm. it was west ish I think, right. about eight miles away, they were sleeting. Two hours before oh, we started any transition. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I wonder if that's enough of just the orographic or effect that yeah. you get. But this, yeah. And mm -hmm. and also uh, just the just the figuring out the inversion height. I mean, you know, you you can you know for the for lake effect. I mean, you, you can get an idea from from the like the bad wind on the ADD, but this just gives you a, just that super resolution on that. That that's you know in real time. Um, you know, there's a good validation of, of what you're thinking and, and um, you know, in, in operational sense. So, again, just even though that the data is, you know, is, is different for the forecasters to look at it, you know, they, you know, we, we still we still look at it to, to validate some of our, you know, some of our, you know, forecast thinking, which is nice. Oh, sure. No, I, th I think it's it's great. I'm you're very fortunate to have that there. Yeah, and, yeah we are. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think it's it's wonderful. I did want to go back. I think Mike, you were talking about uh, with models too, and and I could see where this would be extremely helpful for modelers to to be able to see uh, what's going on. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, but the hope. Well, first of all, what we're hoping to do here is is to you know do some some more it, it, it almost like like an empirical study or something like that, to just, just to sort of see if we can grab any, you know, get any insight, better insight on uh, forecasting, you know, uh, you know, the density or, you know, the, the um, of, of lake effect, you know, the, the snow ratios or whatever, um, using, you know, by using this data and, and, you know, coming up with some relationships. But, but yeah, I mean, absolutely, putting, getting this information into the uh, models. I mean, I, you know, I think, I think, you know, there's a lot of, Microphysical wise, there's a lot of lot of uh, promise of, of with regards to getting this, you know, improving our microphysical schemes and the models using, you know, with this data. Um, I, I mean, I think it's a little ways off, but um, I think there's certainly a promise, some promise there. Right. And to follow up with that, we have um, at Space Science, we have quite a few different folks doing modeling, and um, Brad Pierce, who's on uh, NOAA. Um, part of NOAA, who's in our building, he works on Rackham's model and is really interested in trying to sure. capture the precip because his model doesn't always get these okay. events. I'd say he's part of the time. So another step going forward is sitting down talking with Brad and saying, like, how how can our data help inform his model so that they can dial so that they are capturing these events because they really they really don't capture a lot of the lake effect events. Um, and, and it's a good model. I mean, in general, it's a really good model. So it's nothing. It's just a very difficult problem to solve. And uh, one thing I've been playing with. So it took a while to get this all automated. For a while, I was hand 
doing these and working out problems, but it's pretty automated now, and we had talked about, um, I think I'm at the point where theoretically I could bring in MRR raw spectra data every hour and update the quick looks every hour for the radar. The PIP would still be at yeah. the end of the day, but I mean, for you guys, for forecasting, it's probably the radar data you're using more for yeah, it, it than is the more PIP. radar data. I mean, the, the, PIP the PIP's still nice. useful, yeah. yeah but, I mean, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, we probably do use uh, the reflectivity more. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll have to talk maybe after after we're done. We can yeah. talk about that some more. And, yeah, because now yeah. we're we're dialed in enough where I could run the job every hour right. instead of once an evening, cool. and I don't think it would take up too much no. bandwidth. It's Those pretty are... easy and small. You 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 mean Claire? You can do it from your nice warm office while they're up outside measuring all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so, I I tend to not mind the snow and cold. I routinely am either here green, Greenland or Antarctica. When we, when we had to dig our our oh well, there you go. <laughs> and she was the first one out there digging. So, uh, so. I'm happy to <laughs> happy to play. No, I yeah. So no, it's, I think so. One thing I'll mention is I mean. You guys say it's a true sound vector instruments. It's been a complete treat for us to work at this office because they've been excited, interested, accommodating. We are, you know, come in and be like, we put our instruments where we want. No, we're not quite that bad. But, um, but yeah, no, it's been great. And um, so it's been a really nice experience. And then I get to come up to the UP fairly often, which is a treat for me because I love coming up to the UP. And so, and same with Mark. So we're up here. Like uh, probably four or five times yeah, a year, yeah. um, doing stuff, and we hope to just keep keep this going because it's been it's been great. Yeah, it's been yeah. great. For us. Yeah. Well, it's a great office there, no doubt about it. Good folks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. You're welcome. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> just just make sure Petro uh, keeps on uh, measuring the snow properly. Okay, we'll do. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first time we came, we brought donuts. So we have a tradition for yeah, donuts, so they like us. They, they bring donuts, so we keep them here. We'll probably <laughs> we'll bring them back. Tomorrow's National Builder Day. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, if there's, uh, are there any other questions? So it's almost three. Yeah, so. and people can feel free. Like, again, I left this up, so hopefully people have written it down or screen captured oh. it. They can email me and get I'll, a hold of um, me. And I'll, what I'll do, I have the, the PDF. If Claire doesn't mind, I'll just send it out to the, the list I, um, or put it somewhere so, so you guys can look at it as well, just in case you're interested. So um, I'll send that link out or send it out to everybody. Well, that would be great. And just to let you know, I did record it. Oh, great. Oh, super. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you could get that, um, yeah, get, um, that's great. Besides the forecasters here, a couple of them couldn't make it. They were wanting that. Listen to it as well. Sure, if you don't mind, Claire. I, I forgot oh, to tell right. you before we started. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alrighty, well, uh, um, if there's nothing else, um, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.